Welcome to Jesus and Me, your place to go for Sunday's message from Kingsville Community Church. This Sunday, Pastor Tom Harmon, lead pastor of KCC, explains that God is seeking people after his own heart who will do everything Jesus wants them to do. And now, here's Pastor Tom. This morning I want to speak to you about abiding in Jesus. We've been doing that series and we've been talking about praying and listening to God while we pray. We've been talking about connecting with God and hearing his voice through the Bible, through the word. Uh, We've been talking about different areas that God speaks to us and ways that God speaks to us. He speaks to us in a still small voice. We spent some time uh, looking at that and and the still small voice and how to discern the still small voice of God. Very important because God has a lot to say to us and his spirit doesn't just come on us and leave us, but his spirit lives within us and is there to guide us along and to Uh, to give us wisdom. I love that verse where it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. And how many, how many are glad that verse is in the Bible? Yeah. And how many are glad that when you ask, the Holy Spirit gives you the wisdom and God does lead you and speak with you. But there's some important things that have to go along with praying and believing and faith and loving God. In fact, there's one really important thing and we haven't touched on it yet. And that is obedience, that Jesus expects us to obey. When we're abiding in Christ, Jesus expects us to obey. I was reading uh, just about a fellow who was just frustrated with his kid, with his teenage son. And he would, uh, he would tell his son that you, you need to clean your room. And his, his son would always say, yeah, okay, dad, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll look after it. I'll clean my room. I'll clean my room. And what was frustrating about it was that the, the boy wouldn't follow through. He'd always procrastinate. He'd put stuff off. He, he wouldn't clean his room. Well, after high school, this young man was looking at his different options and came to the conclusion that joining the Marines was probably his best option for what he wanted to do in his future life and so he decided he would join the marines and of course in the marines you go through a grueling six-week basic training course and after that course he went home uh, to visit his family again and his father had asked him what he had learned in the service so far and the boy replied dad he said i learned what it means to clean your room now (laughs) And when we look at obedience, uh, I am I'm struck by the teaching in obedience on how we need to be disciplined in our lives and obedient in the small things. And if we're obedient in the small things, you know, the big things just have a way of looking after themselves. But obedience in the small things, and that's what they teach you when you get into the basic training and things in any kind of army or marine. And, and we have, uh, I have a little clip that I want to show you from Admiral William, uh, what is it, McRaven, who is speaking to a graduating class of the Texas University. And he shares with them a number of things. I've just got a small clip of that. I, I kind of brought it down to one thing that really touches on those areas Uh, being obedient in the really small, mundane things of life. Let's take a look at Admiral William McRaven. Just a moment. I have a few suggestions that might help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served a day in uniform. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation, or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. I've been a Navy SEAL for 36 years, but it all began when I left UT for basic SEAL training in Coronado, California. Basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. 
To me, basic SEAL training was a lifetime of challenges crammed into six months. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened SEALs. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. That's good advice. Be disciplined, be obedient in the little things. And as we look at this whole area of obedience, it is obedience in the little things that make us obedient in the big things. And we can learn some things as we look at the Word of God, and, and we're going to look at a number of things, some things that Jesus taught, and we're going to look at an individual in the Old Testament by the name of Saul, who is like the poster child of cutting corners and not making his bed and not looking after the little things and allowing disobedience to creep in to the big things. And God had to literally, God had to remove Saul from being king and replace him with somebody else who we know as King David. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, the Bible says this, after removing Saul, he made David their king and he testified concerning him I have found David, son of Jess, a man after my own heart. Now, most people stop there and they say, oh, that's what I want to be, Lord. I want to be a man or a woman after your own heart. But that is not the focus of what God is saying. It's what comes next that is the real focus of this scripture. David, is a son of Jess, is a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And that set David and Saul apart. That one thing. See, because David was a sinner and made mistakes, just as Saul was a sinner and made mistakes. And David wasn't perfect. How many here this morning aren't perfect? Okay, there's a guy in the back. He hasn't put up his hand yet. But everybody else here... Uh, we, we, we've got mistakes, and that's good news, because even though you have sinned, even though there are times when you have done things deliberately wrong, you can still be a person, a man, a woman who is after God's own heart if you're like David, and if you get back to God and are looking to do and willing to do everything Jesus wants you to do. My sermon this morning is simply this, that God is seeking people after his own heart that will do everything Jesus wants them to do, that will be obedient in the small things. And if you're obedient in the small things, God will bless your life and he will trust you in the big thing. So let's look at this area of obedience and find some things. You'll find some interesting conclusions that we come to as we look at obedience, and the first conclusion, the first thing is this, that obedience is better than faith. Obedience is better than faith. Now, that's not saying faith isn't important. Faith is extremely important. 
And in a, in a Protestant evangelical church, we hear a lot about faith, but not as much about obedience. And yet obedience is better than faith. Well, where do you get that, Pastor? I, I get that from Jesus' teaching and instruction to the disciples in Luke chapter 17, where Jesus begins to tell his disciples about a brother or sister. When a brother or sister sins against them and repents, they are to forgive that brother or sister. They're for, to forgive them of that offense. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 to 5, it says this, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Se seven times? How many of you would put up with somebody offending you seven times in one day? I mean, like, you know, after lunch, you go to them and say, look, you know, you, you got three and a half more times left. Do you want to get it all over at once or do you want to just spread it out and spread the misery just right through the afternoon? Because this morning was a charm. You know what I'm saying? Seven times. And they're going to, oh, I'm sorry. Are you kidding? Listen to the disciples' response to this. They said then to Jesus, <laughs> increase our faith. Now, many times in your Bible, it's this, this Luke 17 and this discourse between Jesus and his disciples is, is broken up under different headings. But, but this is one conversation. And, and so these guys are like, ha, forget it. They offend me. That they said that, they did that, they hurt me, they sinned against me. I mean, once, <laughs> but, but seven times? Like, if you want me to do that, man, you're going to have to make me Superman of faith. You're going to have to increase my faith because I, I'm not there. I'm not there. And, and folks, there's people like that, that, that they, they're, there's people they won't talk to in their community because they were offended by them, and that's it. They're, I'm not talking to them anymore. There, there's people that, uh, that they won't talk to in their own church. There's people who won't attend church because they went to church and the church hurt them. Oh, I got hurt in church. <laughs> Nobody likes me there. I'm offended. And so Jesus understands. Jesus has news for you. He ain't buying it. And, and we're going we're gonna to get to that. I'm not buying it. We use all of these things. And, and Jesus says to his disciples, see, the disciples are being sarcastic. I, I read a little bit of sarcasm in here. Sarcasm. Seven times a day? And, and then tomorrow, seven times? Again? Are you kidding? Over the course of a Monday to Friday, they're going to offend me 35 times, and I'm going to smile at them and offer them grace and forgiveness, and we're just going to, you know, have a happy time here? Really? That's crazy. You're going to have to give me a whole lot more faith than that. They're being sarcastic. They're kind of mouthing off a little bit to Jesus. Just a little bit. There's a hint of sarcasm in their voice. And Jesus then says to them, his response to that is this, verse 6. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up and roots by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. You don't need more faith. Jesus is saying to them, you know what? Even if you have just a little bit of faith, you can do this. You don't need a whole pile of faith for this. Obedience is far more important. It's much more important than faith. Even with a little bit, you don't need more faith. In fact, even that little bit of faith that you have, until you learn to obey, that faith is dead. Faith without works or obedience is dead. It's dead. And so obedience validates faith. Whether it's great faith or little faith, it's only alive when we're walking in obedience to Jesus. So Jesus says to them, your problem isn't faith. Your problem isn't that you lack faith. Your problem is obedience. You don't have a faith problem. You have an obedience problem. And so Jesus tells them a parable. 
So we're still, we're still in the same room here with Jesus. He's still talking about the same story, the same group of guys. He says, you don't need any more faith. And then he says, and which of you, verses 7 to 10 in Luke 17, which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he think that ser- does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all of the those things which you were commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Jesus is telling this parable, and what he's saying to them is that when the master tells you to do something, you don't need more faith to do it. You just need to do it. You just need to obey. You need to act on what has already been said. So they're saying, well, that's too great. I'm not going to do that. You've got to increase my faith. Jesus is saying... No, it's not more faith, it's obedience. When God says to do something, you just do it. When I say to do something, you just obey. And not only is our faith connected to obedience, but so is our love for God. We begin by reading that verse in 2 John. Jesus in John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, obey what I say, if you love me. And so obedience is so much uh, uh, not better, but it's it's more important because it validates your faith and it validates your love for God. Your love and uh, your faith and your love for God is not validated by what you say, but it's rather how you obey the Lord. Now, the reason... Why many people are still struggling with mountains of problems in their life. Why people are still putting up with fruit that, uh, with trees that bear bad fruit in their lives is not because God is failing them. And it's not because they don't have faith, but it's because their faith hasn't been activated because they're not walking in obedience and these mountains remain and the trees are not pulled up by the roots because we're cherry picking what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, what we like and what we don't like, rather than following the word of God and obeying the Lord. We're picking parts and we're saying, well, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to forgive this person, but I'm not going to forgive that person because I don't like them. I'm going to do this over here because I want this. Even though I know God doesn't want me to do this, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to give over here, but I'm not going to give over there because, you know what, I, I, don't, I want to hang on to that kind of stuff. And so until we're ready to obey God morally, until we're ready to obey God in the things that the Spirit of God says to us, until we're ready to obey God in areas of our life like our finances and all of these things, we can't really expect that God's going to move the mountain or uproot the trees that are bearing bad fruit in our lives. It's just that simple. And that's what Jesus is, take, is teaching. You can't cherry pick the parts that are of the Bible that you want to obey and ignore the parts that you don't. It doesn't work that way. You have to obey God in the little things in order to experience the big things. You have to learn to make your bed. So obedience is better than faith. Obedience is also better than sacrifice. And this leads us right into the life of King Saul. Saul is a vivid picture of what happens when a person flirts with disobedience, when a person never learns to make their bed and look after the little things. Samuel was sent to King Saul with a very clear and specific command. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. Now go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. Now, when 21st century people look at that and read that, they go, whoa, what? 
And we, when we come to, to things in the Old Testament, we, we have to understand that they didn't think like we think. And God enters into their world and God deals with them on the level that they're at that they understand. And so we just can't, can't go back there and go, what? We just, we have to look at that and we have to take lessons from that. Now, the closest thing that we can come to in our day in comparison is when we think of ISIS that will go in and just wipe out cities and towns and, and kill people and behead people. And we know in, in the West, the free nations, that we can't allow them to take over great cities and swaths of land or we're going to have... We're going to have another world war. We're going to have a bigger problem on our hands. And so we have to go in there and, and we can't say, you know what, let's just, let's just allow them to have a couple of towns. Maybe they'll become nice people. We know from experience that doesn't happen. And so we have to go in there and we have to do what we've been doing. And that is to completely take away their control and completely wipe them out. And then they come back and they're like, Oh, you know what? I came from Canada or I came from Europe or I came from wherever and I went and I, I was with ISIS and I want to come back into your country now. Now what do we do with them? I got a great plan for them. I, I, I got a great plan for them. And uh, it, it deals with like the way, the same way we dealt with Nazis. We still hunt them. You still hear about them being thrown in jail because they killed people for no reason. They were committing genocide. And we can say to them, you know what? Welcome home. We got a nice place for you. We'll put you in this nice little room here with a bed, and, and there's a guy in there, there's a 90-year-old Nazi there for you to have company with. When he dies, you can have his toothbrush, and um, you can sit there and you can reflect on life, what it means to be human, and why a billion of uh, your Muslim brothers and sisters did not follow you into ISIS but rejected that. And you know what, we, we have to deal with that, and our governments are struggling with that, but that are some of the things that are happening in Europe now as these people come home after committing all of those atrocities in the Middle East. So that's kind of how we deal with things in the 21st century, not the same way we, they dealt with them 2,500, 3,000 years ago. And so anyhow, so, uh, but somewhat similar in many respects. So Saul responds to God's command. First of all, he immediately gathered his army and attacked Amalek. He attacked them and he killed everyone except... He spared King Amalek. Now, why would he spare the king? Well, here's, here's what kings would do. They would spare the king of the nation that they defeated because they wanted a trophy. How many have a trophy case at home? Nobody. Okay. Neither do I. I didn't. How many never won a trophy? You know, you got the participants ribbon, you know. You participated, thanks. I don't know. I got short legs. My wife got trophies. Me. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, but what they would do is they would keep the king alive and they'd put him in a nice little trophy case and, and he was kind of a, you know, a tro hey, check it out. We got the king here. Hey, 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 yeah, we won. Yeah, yeah, rah, rah, there he is. And uh, so Saul was keeping uh, Amalek uh, alive. He killed everyone except him. And Saul slaughtered thousands of, of animals, except, except he he spared the best of the sheep, the goats, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and gave it to his people so they could sacrifice to God. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Our king is such a, a godly man that uh, we're just going to have all these animals and we can sacrifice the, them. And of course, the people that sacrifice, the worshiper that makes the sacrifice gets to participate in the offering. In other words, I get to take it home and eat it. Yummy. Okay, so... Great king we got. Well, here's God's response to Saul's disobedience. Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel 15, 11. Saul says this, I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. So what do we learn from this very strange, very violent, violent time in Israel's life? And that is this, that partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience to God. James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Don't, don't just listen to the, don't just read the Bible. Don't just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you because you want to have an existential experience. 
Don't just listen to the pastor preach. Don't just merely listen to the word. And what happens? You deceive yourself. That's what Paul, Saul did. He thought, well, I, I did what God told me to do. I mean, you know, I, yeah, I, I just kept the king. And, 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 you know, I wanted a trophy. And the guys wanted some animals, you know. I mean, other than that, uh, what's wrong? Don't just merely listen to the word so, de- so to deceive yourselves. Let's all read the last piece together. Do what it says. Let's read it again. Do what it says. When we sin, the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts. And if we don't repent, a veil of deception begins to form over our hearts, dulling that knife edge of conviction and replacing it with human reason. That's what happened to Saul. When the prophet Samuel came into Saul's camp, This is a war camp. He says, what then is this beating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of cattle that I hear? Nobody goes to war with a whole herd of sheep and cattle. Nobody does that. And then Saul shifts the blame from himself to the people, just like Adam did. Isn't it amazing when we sin, we want to blame everybody else when we mess up, when we're disobedient? Adam says, it's not my fault that... It's the wife, God, that you gave me. It's your fault. You gave me her. And life would be so much better if she wasn't around, right? (laughs) Yeah. Okay, get your own lunch today. Um, So Saul says, uh, Samuel, uh, Saul says this, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and we totally destroyed the rest. And so, again, Saul justifies his disobedience by what? By, by kind of being deceptive and, and, and make it look like, oh, we just wanted to worship you. you no, know, we just wanted a trophy so I could say, hey, look at the guy. We, we won this war. There's the king. Uh, look at what God did for me, us. Yeah, yeah, my trophy. And, 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 and we just wanted to worship you with all these cattle. And I mean, it's the best meat. Why should we waste it in the field? Now, God wants us to worship him through our prayers, through our assembling of ourselves, through our singing, our, 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 everything that we do here was a wonderful worship service. However, according to what the Lord said, obedience, not singing, is the highest form of worship in our lives. Eh? Obedience. God, in other words, God does not make deals. Uh, Saul was trying to make a deal. I'll make a deal with you, God. I know you wanted everything sacrificed, but we'll go to war and we'll do what you asked us to do, but we just want to We just want to keep a trophy, and we want to have some of the livestock for ourselves. Let's, you know, come on, be reasonable. God does not make deals. I I thought I'd make a deal with God once. I wanted to buy this car, and uh, I bought this car, and I made a deal. I went something like that. God, I, I know I don't have the money to buy this car, and I mean, your word says that I'm not supposed to borrow money. Did you know that the Bible says that? Anyway, um... Uh, so, Lord, but, you know, Lord, this will be your car. You ever said that? It's Jesus' car. <laughs> yeah, I said that. And, and you know what, Lord, I'm going to use this car. I'm going to take kids to church in this car. So, I mean, I made a deal with God. And God let me pay for the car. I kind of thought he would, you know, come along and... Help me out here. I made a deal, but God doesn't make deals. He doesn't make shortcuts. There are no deals when it comes to walking with God and obedience, not even in the small stuff. I like what Admiral William McRaven said. If you can't do the little things right, you never get to do the big things right. And oh, don't we learn our own lessons and cause our own problems when we walk in disobedience. If you can't do the little things, there are no deals. There's no shortcuts. People who are after God's heart do everything that Jesus wants them to do. In other words, they learn to make their bed. Amen. And so disobedience, obedience is is 
better than faith. It's better than sacrifice. And the last thing here is that disobedience opens us up to demonic influence. 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now, in the original, that as is as isn't there. The, the translators put that in there to help us with our reading of this, but it's not there in the original uh, manuscripts. And so it literally says rebellion is witchcraft and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. And that's because when we're stubborn and we stubbornly don't want to do what God has asked us to do, what we're doing is we're committing idolatry. We're putting ourselves and setting ourselves up as God. And witchcraft, witchcraft is just a way of manipulating and deceiving things and manipulating things to get control. And so that's why it's put together. You want your own control. You want to do your own thing. And you want to set yourself up as, as God. And, and you're going to do what you want to do and not what God wants you to do. And that's what, he, that's what uh, Samuel says to Saul. And what that does is it opens us up to directly being influenced in the demonic realm. Samuel warned Saul that his rebellion was opening him up to the control of demonic uh, activity in his life. Scripture reveals that it was not long after this rebellion, an evil tormenting spirit did indeed come upon his life and trouble him because it had legal access through disobedience. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. That is, that is the worst thing I believe that can happen to a person in this life is that the spirit of the Lord leaves them. Nobody here has had that happen to them. Nobody. But it happened to Saul. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. God allowed an evil spirit to come and to, to manipulate his life, to manipulate him in jealousy, in anger, in hatred, in strife, in murder, in deception. It controlled him by way of unrepentant disobedience because he was stubborn and he wouldn't humble himself before God. See, it's progressive. You refuse to obey, you're deceived more and more until you can't hear God's promptings or speaking any, any longer about your sin. You open yourself up to an influence, uh, spiritual warfare, and soon you begin doing things nobody could imagine that you would ever do. And finally, you abandon the faith. At this lowest point, just before his death, Saul is no longer praying to God, but he's going and consulting a witch. That's what it would be like in the last days. Paul, uh, Paul tells Timothy 4 verses 1 and 2. The Spirit clearly says, In the last time some will abandon them faith, following deceitful spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. What happened? They began to walk with God, but they walked in disobedience. They didn't learn to make their, make their bed. Disobedience gives the devil what we call a stronghold. That's why we have to completely defeat an enemy like ISIS. You can't allow them to have a little town or a little spot because that becomes a stronghold. And strongholds become places where the enemy works out of in your life to influence other areas. And because the, the, uh, the, the whole... Uh, the whole thing, the whole movement is not to just stay in the stronghold, but it is to go out and to cause damage in other areas and to completely take over your life. That's what we see happening to Saul. And it happened because of disobedience. And the Bible warns us that it can happen to you and it can happen to me. Strongholds develop and give the enemy the opportunity to advance in other areas of your life. It's never just one thing. You're fighting a war, and the enemy wants to take every area of your life. You can't allow him to have a stronghold. Amen? And Saul did, and we see what happens. 
So James gives us the remedy, chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. So humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. The difference between David and Saul, the difference between the guy who makes his bed and the guy that doesn't, is in that verse. The difference between the person who obeys God in the small things and the person who doesn't is in that verse. James 4, because when we make mistakes like David did, we do what Saul could never do. We humble ourselves before God. We come and we say, I was wrong. I sinned. And we humble ourselves before God. We resist. Rather than resisting God, we resist the devil. We resist him and all of his suggestions and his ways. And we find out that he doesn't stick around when he's resisting, resisted. And I could have shown you in this video I showed at the beginning, they have to swim across this channel and it's shark infested. And they got to do it at night. And they got to do it without weapons. And you know what they're told to do if a shark is just ignore the sharks and swim by them. And if one comes up to you, you know what you do with it? You punch it in the nose and it will run. It will swim away. Oh, man, I couldn't imagine that. Can you? Punching a shark in the nose? (laughs) Well, that's basically what this says. When the devil comes around and tries to disobey, you resist him, you punch him in the nose, and he will flee. Draw close to God. That's what David did. Saul ran away from God. David drew close to God. And God will come close to you. This is how you obey. Not by being perfect, but by knowing where you need to go to get forgiveness. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Well, that's what David did. Wash me with hyssop, and I will be clean, David wrote. Or we we go to the cross where we say, Lord, wash me and make me clean. Because of your blood, I am forgiven. We come to the cross in the blood of Jesus and we wash ourselves again and again. And if you fail, you get up and you draw near to God. You humble yourself. You punch the devil in the nose. You go to the cross. You get clean. And you walk away with your loyalty intact to God and not the world. Amen. We need to learn to make our bed. Great analogy, eh? Be obedient in the small things. God is seeking people after his own own heart that will do everything Jesus wants you to do. So make your bed. Be obedient in the small things. And Jesus will bless you in the big things. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask if Katie would just come back to the piano and play. In the closing of this service, I want us to just pray. I'm not going to make an altar call, but I want everybody to be involved. Let's just just close our eyes and let's do something. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord, shall we? And that means we come to God and we say, Lord, I repent. I am sorry. I confess. I confess. Maybe I'm like the disciples and I'm like, huh, it's going to take a lot more faith to forgive that person. I'm, you're holding a grudge. And, and Jesus says, you don't need more faith. You need obedience. Well, it's going to take a lot more faith to start tithing. Jesus said, you don't need more faith. You don't need more money. You need obedience. It's going to take a lot of faith for me to take that step and, and, and change my job. Jesus said, you don't need faith. You need obedience. You need obedience to do what God is telling you to do. And maybe there's an area where you say, Lord, like David, I need to come back to you and say, forgive me. I don't want to be a Saul and harden my heart and be stubborn. 
I want to be like David and I want to just humble myself before God. I want to say, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. Forgive me because I have allowed a stronghold in my life and I've let it defeat me. I, I've given the enemy a place from which to launch attacks and to influence in my life. I haven't wiped him out. Lord, forgive me. But just take some time and just ask the Holy Spirit to show or bring something up that might be there in your life that needs to be, needs to be dealt with, needs to be repented of, needs to be confessed, and just confess it to him now and, and repent. The next thing I want you to do is I want you just to start, start to draw near to God and just thank God for his love and grace for you, that he deals with you in his love and his grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just like David prayed, create in me a clean heart, and I thank you, Lord. Thank you that you remove my sins as far as these from the west. Thank you, Lord, that you deal with me in love and in mercy and in grace. Lord, and you draw me close to you, and you don't take your Holy Spirit from me, but you just want to give me more and more and more and more and more. Now, there may be some guilt or some shame. There may be some doubt or some resistance in your life. And what you need to do is ball up your fist. And I don't want you to do this with your eyes closed because I'm afraid that the person in front of you may not be ready for it. But I want you to imagine yourself punching a shark right in the nose. And if you resist the devil, he will flee. And speak to that doubt and speak to that confusion and speak to that guilt and speak to that fear and that shame and that voice, that accusation that Satan is an accuser and say, be gone in the name of Jesus. And you resist him and he will swim away. He will flee. Thank you, Lord. Now I want you to take that to the cross. We submit ourselves and now we cleanse our hearts and say, Lord, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, to every dirty thing, every sin, every mistake, every thought that is on my spirit that does not glorify you, I pray that you would wash it away with your blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now as we go, say, Lord, I'm fully loyal to you, to obey you in the small things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. And remember, make your bed. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. If you would like to know more about our church, visit kingsvillechurch.com. Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to join us next week.